a joy to be back with you again. And I invite you to turn with me in your, bo- your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 8, book of Proverbs chapter 8. It's 36 verses, so I won't start by just reading the whole passage. I'll read it in chunks along the way. So just have your Bibles open today to Proverbs chapter 8. Let's start by praying together, and then we'll, we'll dive in. Father, as we hear your words to us in Proverbs 8, would you please help us to listen to wisdom? We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Alexander Solzhenitsyn was a famous Russian author who exposed the evils of communism in the Soviet Union. Any of you read anything about that guy? A few of you? Brilliant, brilliant man. The day before Russia exiled him to the West in 1974, he released an essay titled, Live Not By Lies. Maybe you've heard of that essay, Live Not By Lies. He exhorted Russians not to conform to the lies of the Soviet Union, and he argued that those lies are an evil ideology. Those lies are an illusion. Those lies don't correspond with reality. Rod Dreher, I mean, not not that name, he's alive today, he builds on that essay in a book published in 2020, and the title is Live Not By Lies. My wife just read it, where'd she go? She's taking a, yeah, okay, Uh, she she just read it a month or two ago. Uh, And the subtitle is A Manual for Christian Dissidents. And he shows that there are eerie similarities between communist totalitarianism and our current situation in America. And this, he argues, may be affecting you more than you realize. Here's one obvious example, uh, a way that our culture right now is living by lies. About two years ago, in March 2022, there was a Supreme Court confirmation hearing for Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson. A senator asked the judge, quote, can you provide a definition for the word woman? And the judge replied, I can't. I'm not a biologist. And the senator followed up. The, the meaning of the word woman is so unclear and controversial that you can't give me a definition. And the judge, who was confirmed as a Supreme Court justice the next month, refused to define that word. And we all know why, right? Uh, if she gave a basic, scientifically sound definition, she'd have to say something like this. A woman is an adult, human, female but you can't say that. She wouldn't dare say that because that's out of step with transgender ideology. The culture's pretending that a man can identify as a woman and that a woman can identify as a man. And if you identify as something, that makes it so. So our culture is is basically playing this rebellious game of make-believe. Our culture is living by lies. And you might be thinking, That is so clearly a lie. I'm not living by that lie. Well, there are many other lies you could be living by. And I'll just pick five right from the book of Proverbs. Um, Here's one. So I think the children all just left. But if you're still in here and you're a child, listen up. Uh, Children, you are living by lies if you disobey what your parents teach you. You're living by this lie. It goes like this. You'll be better off if you just go your own way. That's living by a lie. Here's another one, number two. Fathers and mothers, you're living by lies if you refuse to use the rod of discipline on your disobedient young children. You're living by the lie that what God tells parents is too severe or too inconvenient. Here's a third. Teens and adults, you're living by lies if you have sex outside of the marriage covenant of one man and one woman. You're living by the lie that God is withholding satisfying pleasures from you and that you'll be happier if you indulge in what God forbids. Here's a fourth lie. You're living by lies if you refuse to work hard and instead you loaf around and you mooch off other people. You're living by the lie that you're so important that you deserve handouts. And here's a fifth one. You're living by lies if you attempt to find ultimate security, and satisfaction in money and possessions. You're living by the lie that getting more stuff will make your covetous and envious heart happy. 
That's just five. We can go on and on and on. My point is that it's foolish to live by lies. We should live in a way that corresponds with reality. We should live by the truth. And that means we need to listen to God's wisdom. And that is what Proverbs 8 is about. I'd like to preach to you from Proverbs 8 on this subject, listen to wisdom. We'll unpack Proverbs in five sections, and we'll start with verses 1 to 3. Verses 1 to 3. So what I'll do is, I'll, as we go through this, I'll read the passage and then comment on it, and we'll, we'll move along. So let's start with verses 1 to 3. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice on the heights, that is on the highest points beside the way? At the crossroads, she takes her stand beside the gates in front of the town. At the entrance of the portals, that is at the main entrance, she cries aloud. So this, these first three verses are the only part of chapter 8 in which wisdom is not speaking. So this section introduces the rest of the chapter. And it raises at least two questions. First question is, what is wisdom? It doesn't define it. So the, the rest of the chapter is describing wisdom, but here the author of Proverbs assumes you already know what it is because you've read Proverbs 1 to 7. So let me just remind you what wisdom is. The opening lines of Proverbs tell you that this entire book exists to help you know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight. So what exactly is wisdom? My favorite way to just put it in a single word is skill or ability. Wisdom is a skill. So let me illustrate this with five examples right from Scripture. So first, Joseph is wise in that he can skillfully govern Egypt. So all these passages use the word wise. So it's saying he's wise in a particular way in how he governs. It's a skill at governing. Another example is Bezalel. He's skillful at craftsmanship and artistic design. So he's wise in that specific area. He's skillful. Third, Hiram can skillfully make any work in bronze. This fourth one is, is really unusual. The people of Israel are skillful at sinning. Like, what? Let me read it to you. Uh, this is Jeremiah 4.22. They are wise, and the ESV puts quotation marks around the word wise, so-called wise. They are wise in doing evil exclamation point, but how to do good they know not. Skillful at sinning. And then five is God himself, he's skillful at accomplishing his holy will. He's perfect at everything he does. So what does wisdom mean in Proverbs? In what sense is a, a wise person skillful? So how would you complete the sentence? A man is wise in Proverbs in that he can skillfully, what goes in that blank? Skillfully do what? So I'll answer in just a second. So one clue to answer that question is to look at parallel terms for wisdom in the book of Proverbs. So a proverb is a form of poetry, so the lines logically relate to each other. In English, we tend to rhyme the sounds for poetry. In the Hebrew poetry, they tend to rhyme thoughts. And sometimes the word wisdom is parallel to a different word that means basically the same thing. So there are at least five words that are parallel with wisdom in Proverbs uh, 1 to 7. Here they are. The words instruction, understanding, knowledge, insight, uprightness. So what, what all these terms have in common is not merely knowing information like a computer database can access facts. Wisdom in Proverbs is a particular kind of skill. So here's how I'd finish that sentence. A man is wise in Proverbs in that he can skillfully live. So we can define wisdom this way. Wisdom is the skill to live prudently and astutely. So prudent means you act with or show care and thought for the future. Astute means you have or show an ability to accurately assess situations or people and turn that to your advantage. So here's, here's a concrete example. A wise man does not merely understand that the speech of a forbidden woman drips honey and is smoother than oil, 
and that in the end, she is as sharp as a two-edged sword and that her feet go down to death. That's Proverbs 5, 3, and 3 to 5. A wise man skillfully applies that knowledge by keeping his way far from her. That's Proverbs 5, 8. And by drinking water from his own well. Proverbs 5, 15. So wisdom is the skill to live prudently and astutely. That's what wisdom is in Proverbs. And that's who is crying out. And that brings us to our second question. What is Proverbs 8 picturing? So I'm going to answer this question by backing up and showing you four sentences from somewhere else in the Bible to illustrate how Proverbs 8 is working. So let's just read these sentences. Number one is from Psalm 98. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together. Sentence two from Isaiah 35. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. Sentence three from 1 Corinthians 13. Love does not insist on its own way. And then sentence four from Proverbs 9. The woman folly is loud. She is seductive and knows nothing. So there's a figure of speech that those four sentences have in common. It starts with a P. Anyone know what it is? I heard it over here somewhere. Personification. That's exactly right. Someone's homeschooled. All right. Uh, Personification is when you represent a non-person as a person. So a non-person includes inanimate objects like a river or a hill or wilderness or dry land. Uh, A non-person includes a virtue like love and it includes a vice like folly. So consider those four sentences again. Rivers, sentence one here, rivers don't clap their hands. People do. The hills don't sing for joy. People do. And in the second sentence, uh, the wilderness doesn't have feelings or emotions like gladness. People do. And that third sentence, love doesn't choose to look to the interests of others. People do that. And then folly isn't a loud, seductive, ignorant woman. Only a person can be a woman. But when we first read those four sentences, I don't think any of you tripped over them. You got the gist, right? You understand what it means to personify an inanimate object or quality. Now, that little lesson, I, I went through that with you because it's crucial to understand how this works in order to understand Proverbs 8. The entire passage personifies wisdom. What we just read in Proverbs 8, 1 to 3 introduces wisdom as a person who is speaking loudly. And the rest of Proverbs 8, all of it, is direct speech in which wisdom talks to us as if wisdom is a person. This passage explains in more detail what Proverbs 1, verses 20 to 21 says. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the markets, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. So the book of Proverbs repeatedly depicts wisdom as this person making a public announcement in a city in the place where the largest crowd of people will hear it. And wisdom's speech in Proverbs 8 is the opposite of someone else's speech in the previous chapter, in Proverbs 7. So I'll refer to the Proverbs 8 woman as Lady Wisdom. And since the wicked woman in Proverbs 7 lurks in the darkness, I call her the Shady Lady. So, uh, Shady Lady versus Lady Wisdom. The two women in Proverbs 7 and 8 are strikingly different. The Shady Lady in Proverbs 7 lurks in the street corners at night, in the darkness, verses eight, chapter seven, verses eight and 12. But Lady Wisdom, in chapter eight, speaks loudly when a large crowd is there during the day so that everyone can see and hear wisdom. The shady lady seeks a young man by seizing him and compelling him with smooth talk in order to lead him as an ox goes to the slaughter. Many a victim she has laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. And in contrast to that, Lady Wisdom seeks to guide us for our good. 
So Proverbs 8 is picturing Lady Wisdom calling out to you. Both the Shady Lady and Lady Wisdom are calling out to you. They're trying to persuade you. So when Proverbs puts them right back to back like this, it's saying, who are you going to listen to? Lady Folly, the Shady Lady, or Lady Wisdom? Who are you going to listen to? Verses 1 to 3 set the scene for wisdom speech. The first part of that speech is verses 4 to 11, which I summarize like this. Listen to wisdom because wisdom is true and valuable. Let's read it, verses 4 to 11. Verse 4, to you, O men, I call, and my cry is to the children of man, to all mankind. O simple ones, O gullible, learn prudence. O fools, learn sense, develop common sense. So in verses 4 and 5, wisdom is basically saying, hey, listen to me. That's, that's how this opens. Then verses 6 to 9, wisdom basically says, listen to me because I speak the truth. Verse 6, hear, for I will speak noble or excellent things, and from my lips will come what is right, for my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There's nothing twisted or crooked. There's nothing deceptive or perverse in them. They're all straight to him who understands. They're straightforward and clear and plain to the discerning. And they're right, they're upright to those who find knowledge. And then in the last two verses of the section, verses 10 and 11, wisdom basically says, listen to me, not just because my words are true, but because they're valuable. They're more valuable than riches. Verse 10, take or choose my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than jewels and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. So listen to wisdom personified because wisdom is true and valuable. Nothing you desire can compare with wisdom. So don't you want, want wisdom? Let's read the next section which starts to describe wisdom. Number three, love wisdom if you want to live prudently and astutely. Verses 12 to 21, let's read those. In verse 12, wisdom describes herself by telling us whom she hangs around. I, wisdom, dwell. I share a home with prudence or shrewdness. That's the right use of knowledge in special cases. And I find knowledge and discretion. That's, that's careful behavior that comes from clear thinking. And then in verse 13, wisdom describes herself by telling us what she hates. We're in July, but we just came out of a month in June in which our country at least some of our country, celebrates so-called Pride Month. Think about that as you read verse 13. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. And to hate here is not only to dislike it, it's to reject it and have nothing to do with it. Verse 14, wisdom describes herself by telling us what she has. I have counselor, good advice, and sound wisdom, sound judgment. I have insight. I have strength. And then verses 15 and 16, she describes herself by telling us what kind of people rightly use her. 15, by me, kings reign, and rulers decree what is just, that is, rulers enact just law. By me, princes rule. They lead with my help, and nobles, all who govern justly. Consequently, we should love and seek wisdom, that's verse 17, because it's valuable, upright, and rewarding. Verse 17, I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently find me. That is, those who diligently seek me find me. Riches and honor are with me. Enduring wealth and righteousness. So wealth is a reward of wisdom. It's not the goal of wisdom. 19, my fruit is better than gold, even fine or pure gold, and my yield, my harvest, than choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness, in the paths of justice. And verse 21, you could think of it at the beginning saying, for the purpose of granting an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasuries. So how does wisdom relate to riches? Wisdom is better than than riches, and wealth is a result of wisdom. Wealth is not a bad thing. 
It's a result of wisdom. Sometimes that wealth comes in this life to some degree in our fallen world, always comes in the next, in abundance. So love wisdom if you want to live prudently and astutely. And then in the next section, the fourth section, wisdom describes herself even more. Wisdom helped the Lord create the heavens and the earth. Verses 22 to 31. Now throughout Proverbs 8, wisdom personified keeps exhorting us, listen to me, listen to me. And you might be thinking, why? Why should I listen to you? And this passage, verses 22 to 31, give four reasons you should listen to wisdom. And I'll say, I mentioned, mentioned this to Pastor John before the service, this section, verses 22 to 31, in my opinion, is the most challenging passage to interpret in the book of Proverbs, and probably top 10 in the Old Testament. So, here we go. Reason number one, I existed before God created the world, therefore, I am distinct from creation, and I am eternal. Let's read verses 22 to 26. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, or his way, beginning of creation, the first of his acts of old. Ages ago, I was set up, so I was formed long ages ago, at the first, before the beginning of the earth. So think of this, at the very beginning when the world came to be. Verse 24, when there were no depths, that is no ocean depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before they were formed, before the hills, I was brought forth. Before he had made the earth with its fields or the first of the dust of the world. All right, I'm going to come back to this, but let me just keep working through these four reasons. That's reason number one, why you should listen to wisdom. Reason number two is I was there when God created the world. I saw him do it. Verses 27 to 29, let's read those. When he established the heavens, that is when he set the heavens in place, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, so think of it this way, when he marked out the place where the sky meets the sea, the horizon, verse 28, when he made firm the skies, the the clouds above, when he established the fountains, the springs of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, implied, I was there. So when you want to understand an important event, you want to hear from someone who was there. You want to hear from an eyewitness. Here's an example. It helped me better understand the tragic events of September 11th, 2001, when I listened to an audiobook titled The Only Plane in the Sky. Have any of you listened to that? Uh, you haven't, Jenny? You have. I think you have. Yeah. Uh, it's, so what it is, it's an oral history in which 500 eyewitnesses tell what they saw. And, and these include President Bush, other government officials, first responders, survivors, friends, family members. It's just all first person. Here's what I saw. Really helpful to understand something. Well, here, you want to better understand God and better understand the world he created? Then listen to wisdom. Wisdom was there when God created the world. Wisdom saw God do it. Wisdom was an eyewitness. That's, that's reason number two. Then number three, listen to wisdom. I wasn't just there when God created the world. I helped God create the world. And help, this isn't in the sense of like he needed help. He was, just, he was part of the process. Uh, God doesn't need anyone's help. Uh, so it's the saying that God is using wisdom in his process. So look at verse 30, first half. Then I was beside him like a master workman. So this implies that if you want to live successfully, you need wisdom. You're a fool if you try to live without it. So thus far, we've looked at three reasons and note the progression. Reason one is I was before creation. Reason two is I was at creation. And reason three is I was the agent of creation. I'm not a creature. I'm not a created thing. I was part of the process of God creating this world. 
And then finally, reason four, I have been God's constant delight and I enjoy God and his world. Look at the last half of verse 30. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing or celebrating before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. That is all human beings, the sons of mankind. So in verses 22 to 31, wisdom is telling us, here's why you should listen to me. When you reject wisdom, you're foolishly going against the grain of how God designed the world. For example, when a man rejects God's wisdom by committing adultery, he suffers the destructive consequences of that sin. And when you reject wisdom, you foolishly reject the creator himself. Those are four reasons to listen to wisdom. But before we move on to the final section, verses 32 to 36, we need to pause here. Here's why I think this is the most challenging passage to interpret in Proverbs. As we read verses 22 to 31, did that description remind you of anybody? Did anyone think, is this talking about God the Son? Did that cross any of your minds? So, Let's, let's talk about that. Is this passage talking about God the Son? Here's what all Christians agree on. God the Father created the world through God the Son. About 2,000 years ago, God the Son took on flesh, and Jesus the Messiah ultimately embodies wisdom. Here's how uh, Paul describes him. Christ is the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God. Christ became to us wisdom from God. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So Christians all agree with that. But Christians don't agree about how God the Son relates to Proverbs 8, 22 to, 20, 22 to 31. So ever since Jesus lived, died, and rose again for sinners, professing Christians have interpreted Proverbs 8, 22 to 31, in at least four basic ways. I'm going to quickly just explain those to you and tell you why I think one of those views is most persuasive. Here's the first view. Proverbs 8 teaches that God the Son is a created being. The Greek translation of the Old Testament renders verse 22 as the Lord created me. So some translations say created I think the ESV translates verse 22 well with the word possessed. Also, verse 24 says, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. The NASB translates that, I was born. In the church's first centuries, there were some people who denied that Jesus is God. And one of their main arguments was that Proverbs 8 teaches that the Lord created Jesus and that therefore God the Son is not eternal and thus not God. There's a popular teacher named Arius who said this, there was a time when the Son was not. That is when the Son did not exist. This is a false teaching called Arianism. And it's what modern day Jehovah's Witnesses believe. According to this view, Jesus is a creature and thus not God. Christians rightly consider this view to be heresy, which is why I introduced it as a view that some who profess to be Christians hold. It's not a Christian view. But Christians don't agree on how exactly to interpret Proverbs 8 with reference to God the Son. The next three views are Christian views, but they can't all be right. So here's view number two. Proverbs 8 teaches about wisdom and not about God the Son. So some Christians argue that we should interpret the Old Testament apart from the New Testament without letting the New Testament affect at all how we interpret the Old Testament. So according to this view, Proverbs 8 is exclusively about wisdom and not about God the Son at all. God the Son is not present in Proverbs 8. That's what this view says. And I don't think this view is correct. In a moment, I'll show you why I think it's better to say that in Proverbs 8, God, the divine author of scripture, intended to communicate about God the Son. So that leaves us with views three and four. Here's view three. Proverbs eight 
directly describes God the Son. So according to this view, Proverbs 8 does not personify the virtue of wisdom. It's not about a virtue. It's about a person. It's not about wisdom. It's about God the Son. So if this view is right, then I'm wrong because this whole sermon I've been saying this is personification and this is wisdom personified. So this view said, no, it's not about wisdom personified. It's about God the Son. So uh, those who hold this view would say that Proverbs 8 directly describes God the Son when he took on flesh. Actually, some say that. Some would say this describes the incarnation, when God the Son took on flesh. Uh, in the early church, Athanasius rightly and valiantly argued against Arius that Jesus is God. He's a good guy. Athanasius is one of our guys. Uh, but, but here, when he, when he exegetes this text, he argues that Proverbs 8 refers to Christ's incarnation. That is, when God the Son took on flesh. It doesn't refer to when God the Son existed before the incarnation. So that's that's one way that people who hold this view interpret it. Here's another. In contrast to Athanasius, some Christians specify that Proverbs 8 directly describes God the Son, particularly when the triune God created the world. So according to, the, to this view, wisdom is what the Lord possessed from the beginning, which means that wisdom is eternal and thus refers specifically to God the Son. And some might protest against this view and say, well, Proverbs 8 describes wisdom as a woman. So how can that refer to God the Son? And adherents of this view would answer, well, the word for wisdom in Hebrew is feminine, grammatically, which is typical for abstract words. And then a further argument for this view is that Proverbs 30, verses 3 and 4, identifies the wisdom of Proverbs 8 with God's Son and a passage that asks, who has ascended to heaven and come down? And that's a passage that John 3.13 connects with Jesus. So some of my dear friends, whom I highly respect, hold this view. And it might be correct. But this view to me seems strained. I think view four is most persuasive. You knew it would be the last view, didn't you? So, all right. So here's how I describe what I think is the right view. Proverbs 8 describes wisdom personified. And God the Son fulfills this passage because he ultimately embodies wisdom. So I think Proverbs 8 connects to Jesus by analogy. More specifically, I think that Proverbs 8 is picture prophecy. Or you could call it typology. So to explain what I mean by that, I'm going to have to step back for a moment here and explain how the Old Testament and New Testament relate to each other. So I'm going to go into seminary mode seminary professor mode for just a minute. You're like, you're just now going into seminary professor mode? Uh, yeah, yes, um, but if you can stay with me, I really think this will help you appreciate how God designed the whole Bible to fit together. So here's, I put it on the screen here just so you can follow me here. This is what I believe. New Testament authors consistently interpret Old Testament passages in their literary context. And Old Testament passages may have an expanded meaning that the divine author intended all along, but that the human author did not consciously intend. So let me, I need to unpack what I mean by this. Three key uh, things to talk about here, uh, three components. An expanded meaning, a whole Bible approach, and typology. So let's start with that, ex that term expanded meaning. I think an Old Testament passage may have an expanded meaning that its human author did not consciously intend but that the passage's divine author did intend. And it's that divine intention that the New Testament authors occasionally refer to when they discern an expanded meaning in an Old Testament passage. And if that term concerns you, let me just qualify. I, I am not saying that an Old Testament passage's meaning changes. No. I'm saying that in retrospect, you can recognize there's more to it than the human author was aware of when he wrote those words, but that God was fully aware of. That's all I'm saying. Second is a whole Bible approach. This is the basis of recognizing an expanded meaning. So a whole Bible approach views the whole Bible as the ultimate literary context for any passage of Scripture, especially an Old Testament passage. The whole Bible has a unity because it has a single divine author. Old Testament authors may have suspected 
that something they wrote was pregnant with meaning about the Messiah, for example. They may have had an inkling about that, but even if they didn't, authors in the Old Testament would never object to how New Testament authors use their words. I, I, I can't imagine you know, Hosea saying, Matthew, what are you doing in chapter 2? With out of Egypt I called my son. I was talking about Israel. I wasn't talking about Jesus. You ripped my words out of context. An Old Testament author would never think that way. He would understand, oh, wow, I didn't understand all the connections going on here. This is beautiful. It's totally in line with what I was intending. I just didn't know all the details. I think more, something like that is going on. So I have in the parentheses here, God may intend more, but not less than what the human authors intended. And number three is typology. This is how we recognize how this goes on. How, how there could be an expanded meaning that the divine author intended, but that the Old Testament human author didn't consciously intend. Typology is picture prophecy. It, an, it analyzes how New Testament people, events, institutions fulfill Old Testament people, events, and institutions. So I have three examples on the screen. King David, the Exodus, and the sacrificial system. So Jesus fulfills David as the greater king. That's typology, picture prophecy. Another example, Jesus fulfills the Exodus. That's an event. How do you fulfill an event? With a greater redemption. And then Jesus fulfills the sacrificial system as a better sacrifice. There are lots of these kind of connections as you, as you read the Bible and put it together. And God intended all of those connections. It's beautiful. That's typology. That's, uh, that's how fulfillment works. You repeat Old Testament situations at a deeper climactic level that God intended all along. Are you still with me? Everybody with me? Okay. All of that was so that we could take that information and go, oh, that's what I mean in Proverbs 8 when I'm arguing that this is picture prophecy. I'm saying this. In the context of the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 8 describes wisdom personified. In the context of the whole Bible, Proverbs 8 prophetically pictures God the Son. That is, God the Son ultimately fulfills this passage because he ultimately personifies wisdom. God the Son is eternally existing. Uh, he is the eternally existing agent through whom God created the world. So wisdom describes God's character when he created the world, and God created the world through God the Son. Listen to a handful of passages from the New Testament describing God the Son, and does it not make you think of chapter 8 in Proverbs? John 1, all things were made through him, through the word, through God the Son, and without him was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1, by him, by God the Son, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Hebrews 1, God the Father says to God the Son, You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. So Proverbs 8, 23 to 26, emphasizes that wisdom existed before God created the world, and the New Testament emphasizes that God the Son is before all things. That's Colossians 1.17. The Gospel of John begins, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Here's a really important connection. Revelation 3.14 describes Jesus as the beginning of God's creation. I think that's referring to Proverbs 8.22. So Jesus in Colossians 1 is the firstborn of all creation in the sense that he's preeminent over creation. He's supreme over creation. So to summarize, Proverbs 8, 22 to 31 says that you should listen to wisdom for four reasons. I existed before God created the world, therefore I'm distinct from creation and I'm eternal. Two, I was there when God created the world. I saw him do it. Three, I wasn't just there when he created the world. I helped them create the world. And four, I have been God's constant delight and I enjoy God and his world. I think that God the Son fulfills this passage because he ultimately embodies wisdom. Now, let's consider the final appeal in verses 32 to 36, which I'd summarize like this. Listen to wisdom if you want to be happy. 
Let's read it. Verse 32. And now, O sons, listen to me. For blessed, happy, joyful are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and don't neglect it. Don't ignore it. Blessed is the one who listens to me. Happy, joyful is the one who listens to me. Watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who fails to find me injures himself. That is, he invites all kinds of disaster into his life. All who hate me love death. What a line to end on for the chapter. All who hate me love death. Now, you want to be happy, don't you? You all want to be happy. That's what we all want. You choose what you choose because you want what you want, and what you want is to be happy. Sometimes you believe lies. Sometimes you think that sinning will make you happy. You think that rebelling against God will make you happy. And you might feel a short-term buzz of pleasure, what Hebrews 11 calls the fleeting pleasures of sin, but that pleasure doesn't last. You won't ultimately be happy by rebelling against God, by gossiping, by overeating in a greedy way, by being bitter at someone, by greedily amassing a lot of money, or by covetously longing for more stuff, or by pretending that you're female when God made you male, or pretending that you're male when God made you female, or by anxiously doubting whether God's words are true and trustworthy, or by indulging in worldly entertainment, or by pursuing sexual pleasures outside the marriage covenant. If you want to be happy, that's not the way. If you want to enjoy ultimate happiness, ultimate satisfaction, there's one way, and that's to listen to wisdom. Listen to wisdom. There are two ways to live. You can ignore wisdom and thus injure yourself and find death, or you can listen to wisdom and thus be happy and find life. So which way are you going to go? Listening to wisdom does not mean merely that you follow wise advice. It does mean that you follow the wisdom in the book of Proverbs, of course. But it's more than that because Jesus ultimately embodies wisdom. So ultimately, listening to wisdom means that you obey Jesus. It means you obey the perfect wisdom of God. That means obeying the book of Proverbs and the rest of the Bible with God's help. So to summarize, the main idea of Proverbs 8 is listen to wisdom. What is wisdom? It's a skill to live prudently and astutely. Wisdom is calling out to guide you. Listen to me, listen to me. Listen to wisdom, why? Because wisdom is true and valuable. Listen to wisdom if you want to live prudently and astutely. Remember, wisdom helped the Lord create the heavens and the earth. So a final appeal, listen to wisdom if you want to be happy. So if there's an area in your life in which you're not listening to wisdom, maybe that's coming to mind right now. You're thinking, oh, I'm, I'm living by lies in this area. I'm not listening to wisdom in this area. Don't be a fool by ignoring wisdom. Wisdom understands reality. It understands how the world works. And Jesus Christ ultimately embodies wisdom. He created the world. He sustains the world. He rules the world. So if you want to be happy, ultimately happy, submit to King Jesus. Follow Jesus. Love Jesus. Enjoy Jesus. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for speaking wisdom to us. Please open our ears so that we will truly listen to wisdom. Help us reject lies and live according to the truth. Help us see wisdom as true and valuable. Help us love wisdom. Help us live prudently and astutely. And we thank you that Christ embodies wisdom. Please help us treasure Christ in all of life. Amen. Thank you. All right, uh, a couple wrap-up things from that. Um, he, uh, he, he, he joked about seminary mode. Um, and you know that recently I've talked about how seminary gets joked about. So let's talk about that for just a quick second. Uh, um, I think what you saw this morning, that little taste of seminary mode, is really good for us to see. Because I'm, I'm going to overstate a little bit in what I'm going to say next, but it's generally true. It's really helpful for all of us to understand that seminary is not 
a place where people go and study the Bible so that they'll then know the Bible for ministry. Seminary is a place where people go to learn how to study the Bible, and they then spend the whole rest of their life, pastors then spend the rest of their life studying the Bible to do ministry with, with people. And that's what you got a little taste of this morning. It's not that you go to seminary so that someone can tell you what Proverbs 8 means, but so that they can teach you how to think through a passage like Proverbs 8 without falling into heresy so that you can then study all the Proverbs in healthy biblical ways to serve the flock of God with it. So that's really what seminary is all about. It's about learning to, learning how to study the Bible, including how to guard against sound doctrine, how to interpret difficult passages. So I, I'm just thankful you got kind of a little taste of what that's like, because that really was like, that's what your years of seminary are like. It's that hard thinking, and then it's, it's the homework that demonstrates that you're learning how to do that hard thinking and can go effectively into pastoral ministry and be able to do that quickly. And then secondly, I just wanted to say that I don't have to agree with everything Dr. Nacelli said this morning, but I do. Uh, so I'm thankful for that. And I especially love the two phrases he gave you, expanded meaning and whole Bible approach. I just completely agree that there are many things in the Old Testament where the original author that God used may have had some sense that there was more going on here, may have thought, hmm, I wonder where this points. But there was much more actually in what they were writing than even they fully understood because there is a divine author behind all of Scripture. And that really is where that whole Bible approach comes from. And that's a very practical thing for you to know in your Bible reading. When you read, look first at what's the context, what's going on here. Stay right there in that passage first. But then say, hmm, how does this fit into the whole picture? Paul said that to the Ephesians that he had not failed to preach to them the whole counsel of God, which refers to the whole purpose of God, the big picture of what God is doing. You keep in mind the big picture, and hmm, how does this little part fit into the big picture? So I love that. I think that was really helpful for us. Um, uh, so then let's just, a couple final comments about wisdom, and then I'll give a charge and benediction, and then um, um, 10 to 12 you've got Bible study, and then Pastor John will be up right away to lead us into prayer meeting. So when we think about whether we are wise, um, it's such a great need in these days, and I want to go back to something else Dr. Nacelli said kind of tongue-in-cheek earlier. He was referring to Athanasius, and you remember when he said, he's one of our guys, right? He's one of those people you can listen to. Isn't that where we all are at in life in these days when the news is just like this blur of what in the world is going on and it feels like everybody's lying about everything? We're all trying to figure out who are the good guys so that we can listen to them. But sometimes even the people we think are the good guys we should be listening to aren't actually giving us biblical wisdom. And so it's a great reminder for this this morning that as much as we want to know who the good guys are that we can listen to, ultimately Christ and Scripture are the only infallible source of what's wise and what's true. So whatever it is that you're looking at life, trying to figure out how do I live, ultimately we have to measure everything by Christ and what, what God says. So let me finish this this morning with Colossians 1, and then Pastor John will come shortly uh, to transition you into prayer meeting. Colossians 1, verses 9 and 10. May you be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Amen.